Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today and uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, and where am I? There we've got... Uh, okay, so look, I've got a few minutes to talk to you um, about science and medicine um, and before I do that I realise you're all knackered, tired and halfway through a week where you are fighting lethargy um, and recovering from hangovers much like this diagram shows and I don't know whether you're staying alive at the moment via your uh, vestigial hindbrain but there are some interesting parts to this diagram. I was asking Dean earlier on if you guys still use mnemonics and I think the answer to that question is yes. Does anyone have a mnemonic for the uh, cranial nerves? <laughs> that, that's actually um, that's not rude. We learnt some that they're all very, very uh, disgusting actually, but um, who barracks for Collingwood? This slide is for you because they can't spell tonight. So when your mates from Collingwood arrive later on today, you need to let them know that there was a slide specifically for them today. Okay, so look, I'm going to talk to you briefly about the journey of someone like myself, who's a physician scientist. The challenges, are, whoa, whoa, holy moly. The challenges uh, in medicine in 2018, some of the things you might be familiar with, some transformative technologies, and then some new therapeutics, and hopefully, at the end, some lessons learnt from being in this game for quite a while. So my journey started back in UWA, as Dean said. Um, I actually play um, drums in a band and there was an awful lot of loud noise and alcohol through medicine um, and somehow we survived. You guys all go on a conveyor belt and that conveyor belt takes you through medicine pretty safely. You can fall off but usually your friends bring you back and um, rescue you. Um, best decision ever made was um, inviting my wife out for a date. The best mentor I've ever had, and boy, do we all need mentors, was a guy called Len Harrison, who's a senior physician at uh, Royal Melbourne Hospital, but also at the Walter and Liza Hall Institute, where I did my PhD. And that got me thinking about science and that wonderful nexus between clinical medicine and science. I then met this guy, Bill Chin, and Bill's a professor of medicine at Harvard and I had the joy of working in his laboratory as a postdoc where I really learnt about science um, and the intersection with clinical medicine. And then when I was in Boston in those days, some of my friends said to me, why are you going back to Perth to die? And the reality then in Perth, there was very little science. There was fantastic medicine, but very little science. And in real terms, a small group of us, Peter Clinken, the first director of the, of the Harry Perkins Institute, uh, Rod Minchin, who's now in, in uh, Queensland, and the three of us set about generating an institute. And we did, and that institute is called the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research. But throughout all of this, there's been this incredible imperative to keep family close, to keep uh, a life outside of medicine. And I've mentored a whole lot of medical students over the last 20 years and having a life outside of medicine as a medical student is incredibly important. Mind you, having a life outside of medicine uh, when you're graduated is equally as important. And you'll notice here there's a little stethoscope with a guitar in it. So after a long sojourn without playing in the band, I re, um, re uh, organized the band and got ourselves back together a couple of years ago. So I have the pleasure of leading an institute that is here and we are sitting over here in the middle of Perth and the Harry Perkins Institute sits on a campus that has about 12,000 people on it. There is a brand new Perth Children's Hospital, the Telethon Institute, the Harry Perkins Institute, St Charles Gardner Hospital, the um, Lion's Eye Institute, the State Cancer Centre, our Linear Clinical Trials Facility and the Path West and of course UWA is down here. So it's a pretty concentrated setup. I've just come back on Monday night from uh, the largest 
medical centre in the world, Texas Medical Centre, which is 120,000 people, and this campus has about 12,000 people. MD Anderson Cancer Centre has 35,000 people, so the Texans know how to do it big. The Perkins is a fantastic place. It is about 450 people, um, about 22 lab heads, 25% of them are clinicians, and we do discovery research and translate that as hard and fast as we can to the bedside with an accent on some commercialization. So the joys of being a clinician scientist, if you, I wear a whole lot of hats, and at the moment you're all wearing one hat. The one hat will get you through medicine, okay? But once you've gone through the door, you've actually got the opportunity to have multiple hats. And so I wear quite a few hats. I still work as a doc. I love working as a doctor, and I work at Royal Perth Hospital. I'm the director of the Perkins. I run a laboratory in the Perkins. I'm chairman of a phase one clinical trials facility. It's a 32-bed uh, ward, essentially. It's the Charles Garden Hospital. And I'm somewhat entrepreneurial because we've got a small company called Miravan that's commercialising an anti-cancer agent for liver cancer. But equally, um, and I can see Nick in the audience, uh, Nick Liebman graduated not long ago, I'm just as much, and in fact most importantly, the most important bit of this slide is on the right hand side. You know, I'm a dad, I'm a die-hard Eagles fan, obviously don't like uh, Collingwood very much. I love music in the band, I'm a cyclist, skier, teacher, mentor, and I've mentored lots and lots of medical students over the years and love it. But I'm involved in a bunch of other committees and various things. And when Cameron invited me to, to speak, he really wanted to have some idea about the breadth of someone like myself as a physician scientist, what we do, how we got to where we have arrived, um, and what's important in our lives. So for me, the question is, you know, why medicine and science? Um, there's this incredible, might wander over here, there's this incredible unique capacity when you do both to mix it uh, with, you know, medicine with innovative, curiosity-driven science. It's a, it's a wonderful luxury uh, to be able to do both. I implicitly believe that a strong research base makes the best docs and makes the best culture for the best healthcare and medicine. So if you think about Johns Hopkins, the fact that I was at MD Anderson Centre, Cancer Centre, I was at Harvard Medical School, what's great about those places? Well, the research underpins the clinical care in, in, uh, in, inordinately and very strongly. Both medicine and science create this incredible collaborative relationship. It's a people oriented job. Um, and of course, I'm keen to make a difference. I want to make a difference both scientifically, but also from a clinical perspective. And I love the new cutting edge technologies. I'm going to show you a bunch of slides with some of those technologies. Um, genomics, imaging. I love teaching, both clinical and science. Today I had some of my honours students talking with me. Um, and then uh, when I'm in the hospital, I'm teaching uh, endocrine registrars and uh, six-year medical students. And of course, there are entrepreneurial opportunities. And a lot of you are going to be more than just docs. You're going to be entrepreneurial in a lot of the things that you do. So I can't say this more strongly, that the best places to do medicine are those that have the best research. And many of you will remember this crazy experiment done by Barry Marshall uh, and Robin Warren. Um, and Barry Marshall drank, as many of you will know, um, Helicobacter, gave himself an ulcer, and it was a crazy experiment. Robin Warren's often forgotten, but he's the guy who saw the bugs, and these guys got the Nobel Prize um, in uh, 2005. Um, and over the weekend, um, or in the last few days, I was at a meeting uh, on RNA therapeutics, and there were two Nobel laureates there. There's a guy called Craig Mello, who discovered um, RNAi, and there's a guy called Phil Sharp, who discovered splicing. Both uh, made incredible um, uh, sort of discoveries. So what are the challenges? What are some of the really big challenges in medicine uh, in 2018? And let's think about where you are and where I was, because they're very different scenarios for you guys. So when I started medicine, there was a clinical phenotype, and there always is going to be a clinical phenotype. There was a radiological phenotype, but not that much of a sophisticated one, and a histological phenotype. It's changed dramatically. 
there are signatures in every part of the clinical pathway, be it the, your genetic risk or any of the omics, be it metabolomics, epigenomics, genomics, proteomics, you name it, there's plenty of omics and there's the signatures that are going to happen to, in, in medicine in the next 20 years are incredibly complicated. That sets up the requirement for really complex integrated data analysis that has to be fed back to clinicians to make sense of, of the patient in front of them. That's a huge challenge and very poorly done uh, across the world at the present time. So what I want to do in the next few minutes is, is talk about some of these. We're not going to be able to talk about all of them, but if you have a look at them, patients are going to be empowered. They're going to be empowered in ways that we've never ever uh, allowed them to be in real terms via the web. The omics revolution is going to transform things in ways that we've never really understood or have the capabilities to understood before. Health sensors, portable diagnostics, I'm going to talk about organs on a chip, talk a little bit about 3D printing, uh, nothing about nanotechnology in real terms. Clinical trials, they're changing dramatically. The microbiome, I love the microbiome, um, you are what you eat. Uh, CRISPR. There's now a CRISPR journal, can you believe it? There's three editions of the first CRISPR journal, which is going to transform a lot of what we do. There are recreational cyborgs. I presume you guys all know what a cyborg is. Um, it's a combination, it's a human who's got uh, human bits and, and non-human bits. And I'll show you one of those. And I think the hospitals of the future aren't going to be like during your time, what you know at the beginning, they're going to become a very different uh, place in real terms. Immunotherapy is going crazy, telemedicine and of course AI and virtual reality. So um, you know, I suppose all of that means that for you at the beginning of your medical career, there's some rethinking to be done uh, about the way that medicine is going to be taught in the next few years. Now I hope this works because check this out. So this is a, a wonderful way of learning anatomy virtual reality. Right, out come the lungs, the bronchi, and if you want to light up the left lobe, or if you want to learn the anatomy of the skull, and all the bones beautifully aligned. So this would be a cruel way of learning anatomy. And this, an in situ set of MRIs. So that's not available to you now, but it should be in real terms because that's what you know, the, the future is. And this guy is where we are currently in real terms. You know, this is, we're blunder busting away in medicine at the present time for a lot of it. If you think about the, the precision you might want to bring to someone with cancer, um, and then you think about the way we actually do treat cancer a lot of the time, it is pretty crude. And you ask any man in their 50s if they want to smell that uh, latex glove going on and the, and the lidocaine jelly going on the GP's finger. It's not a pleasant experience, I can tell you. So, so, so that's the challenge uh, before me and before you guys that we have to defeat. So let's talk about some of these, these uh, transformative technologies and just want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about some of these guys because they're important and just share with you some of the things that I think are really exciting and where research is going and how it will uh, sort of, as it were, invigorate and enthuse you from a clinical perspective. So you've, you, we all know about wearables and, and uh, how radiologists will leave a dinner party and they'll go out and look at their, their phone and they'll report a couple of films and diabetics are going to come back to you with all sorts of sugars um, and the capacity from a diagnostic point of view, is going to change dramatically. Sensors, trackers, wearables, the data collection is going to be unreal. So I have patients who email me, I have patients who ring me, I don't have anyone who sends data like this, but it is very, very close. And there are various towns in the US where there are experimental towns where all the data is held by the patient. They are the custodians, whoops, they are the custodians of their own health. And that's a new place to go for medicine when you think about it. Because at the moment, you guys think that the hospitals and doctors and GPs are the custodians for people's health. In fact, it's going to change 
patience and their data will be their own and they'll siphon it out to you. The advances in genomics and the omics revolution and artificial intelligence is incredibly exciting, but very, very irrelevant for most of medicine right now, but it's going to change. And I think this is really, this is really important because it's going to change. Doctors and their patients are going to be in a collaborative relationship rather than the current relationship that they currently um, uh, sit in. I think that's also exciting. So if you haven't seen a cyborg, this guy is a classic cyborg. A guy called Neil Harbison, and that is a, that's an antenna because he has the inability to uh, see colour, any colour. He sees everything in black and white. So his antenna is basically locked on so he can, he can see colour. Uh, and he's one of uh, you know, a real true cyborg because to function as, an, as a complete being, he needs his, um, his uh, technology driven device. Um, there are people who are having bits put in them, uh, so-called recreational cyborgs, because they think it's cool. <laughs> it's another world, isn't it? Nothing is going to change the importance and the sanctity of this, though, which is just being a normal doctor and talking to patients. It sounds really simple, but the very best docs, and I've been fortunate to be with some fantastic clinicians, the wisdom that comes in clinical medicine comes with time and experience only. Nothing can take that away. Okay. Let's just talk briefly about the omics revolution because running a medical research institute and being a scientist myself, this is exciting, it's wonderful, um, but what's the application? So here's this guy who says, I'm worried that health's become too impersonal, doc, and the guy says, nonsense, just relax, lie back on the barcode scanner. Um, and you know, how, how far away is that from reality? Well, uh, some of the work I'm doing uh, in the Andrew Forrest Mindaroo campaign is trying to generate an, uh, a universal cancer database where people's, all, all of their data, I should say, would be put into this universal cancer database. So this is not that far away in real terms. What I do want to point out on this slide, though, is that the omics resolu uh, revolution is giving us signatures. And it's giving us signatures of tumours such that where the tumour comes from is really not going to matter much. It's the signature that's going to matter. So there are trials uh, such as this one, which is from the National Institutes of Health in the US, where tumours that share the same genetic abnormality, regardless of where they come from, um, are going to receive uh, the drug that targets that abnormality. Um, and I met a guy last week when I was away in the US who has bladder, transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. Um, and he was being treated with Herceptin. And Herceptin, as some of you will know, is the drug that women use for ERB-B2 overexpressing breast cancer. But he's taking that because his transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder expresses HER2 receptors and he's doing incredibly well on Herceptin, ir ir irrespective of the location of the tumour or the original site of origin, he's getting a breast cancer drug for his transitional cell cancer. This is a huge issue, the heterogeneity in cancer. How on earth do we overcome that? Well, we overcome that by deconstructing, as they do on MasterChef, they're going to deconstruct uh, Pavlova. We now deconstruct tumours into single cells. And this simple diagram basically says this is your tumour. We typically treat it like this, a gamish of yoghurt. Uh, or fruit salad, but in fact single cell sequencing now allows us to very, very precisely um, understand the intricate nature and, ma and architecture of, of uh, carcinomas. And so us and many other places around the world are deconstructing human tumours into their single cell architecture and finding out incredible um, amounts of new information. So here's a Here's a pipeline that we've generated here in, the, in, uh, in my institute for multiple cancers. There are calcitrant cancers such as liver carcinoma, pancreatic carcinoma, glioma, etc. And we take uh, the samples, they are then put into suspensions, they are put into libraries and then there's single cell sequencing. It's absolutely amazing. 
Here's an example of what we get with oral, uh, oral uh, squamous cell carcinoma, lots of uh, separation into multiple cell types. What does that actually look like? It looks like something like this. This is just T cells from someone's tumour, uh, but in real terms you separate the subsets of cells out beautifully. You can see progenitor cells, tiny amounts of 0.3%, and those cells could be the cells that, that um, recreate the tumour and, and produce recurrence. So, it's a wonderful time for cancer because the next five years will be the deconstruction of cancers into single cells and then the identification of new ways of treating those cancers. But you've got to be careful what you wish for. And here's a Dilbert cartoon that says, you know, I combined a DNA test uh, with big data. And in real terms, that produced the, the knowledge that depressed so many, so many people in his workplace that half of them killed themselves in real terms. So the more information that we get, the more cautious we're going to have to be about how we use that information and then how the public and community are informed about the implications of that, of the, of that information for their survival. Are we trained as geneticists? No. Are we going to have to deal with genetic information? Yes, because the progress is progressing at a rate that is so quick we're not going to be trained fast enough to be good enough at this. It's an incredibly challenging area and we can talk about it during the Q&A period if you'd like. What about immunotherapy? This is just amazing when you think about what's happening. You all know about the PD-1 and pd one uh, interactions between uh, cancer cells and lymphocytes um, and CTLA-4 and a whole bunch of therapeutics uh, aimed at these guys. Um, and here are just some of the landmark papers. They're extraordinary. And I want to draw your attention to this one that really started this whole barrage of new therapeutic avenues. This was 2015 New England Journal. Uh, and people with metastatic melanoma, but they were all dying. Every single person was dying. And there were 40 years went by with, without any advancement at all in, in metastatic melanoma. And along comes uh, immunotherapy and the combination of two different types of immunotherapy, checkpoint inhibitors, dramatic improvement. And in fact, some of these people, this is now 17 months back in 15, some of these people are still alive many, many years later. So immunotherapy for some people with cancer has been spectacular and it's been thrown at every single recalcitrant tumour in combination with as many different uh, um, um, immunotherapy agents as possible. These are a couple of papers from this year with combinations with either chemotherapy or two different types of immunotherapy. So watch the space, know about it. I hated immunology when I was a medical student. It was taught terribly and hoped I'd never have to think about it again. But my whole institute is thinking about it in my own labs, treating people with immunotherapy, or treating uh, mice, I should say, <laughs> little people with immunotherapy. Um, and it's an incredibly important part of the therapeutic armamentarium. So is CAR T cells, and CAR T cells are now transforming some aspects of cancer biology and cancer therapeutics. And the concept there, as you know, is crank up the T cells to see the antigens on the tumour and kill them. You can buy CAR T cells off the counter now. You don't have to take them from the patient. So you can, there's all sorts of commercial opportunity to actually make a difference in the context of cancer. All this brings with it incredibly important questions about how on earth are we going to afford this? A single person CAR T therapy for a year is $200,000. People are selling their houses, they're selling everything they can possibly get to get access to these things. And you go to America and it's a very different deal with regard to health than it is here. So how are we going to afford medicine in 2025 when you're uh, our young residents? Um, this is a really big question and I, we don't have the answers at the present time. CRISPR, CRISPR is awesome. Um, CRISPR is this way where you can get into the DNA and cut it and modify it uh, epigenomically in any way, shape you want. You can put genes up, you can put genes down. Um, and instead of using checkpoint inhibitors, for example, you can literally um, CRISPR them out, as it were. And as I said, there's a CRISPR journal now. So I was gobsmacked over the weekend about the speed with which CRISPR is taking medicine by storm. Here's a bunch of solid tumours, all of which are in clinical trials, all of which have got cells taken out of the body, artificially played around with CRISPR, uh, CRISPRing out genes, putting them back into the patient and treating their, their cancer. So it's an area of massive 
and rapid change. Now, I don't know how much you guys know about the microbiome, but it's a really, really exciting area. Um, I, it's, it's the sort of the last frontier. Um, you know, when I was a medical student, I never believed anything about you are what you eat. We could eat anything. We were pretty fit and healthy. We did a lot of exercise. That's all changed. You really are what you eat to some extent. And um, uh, the microbiome as the last frontier is going to be a really interesting area for medicine in the next 20 years. Being able to tweak your microbiome for cancer, tweak it for diabetes, tweak it for, for weight loss. It's almost as if you go to the supermarket and you pick up your yuckult to treat your glioma, your yuckult to treat your diabetes, your yuckult to treat your Clostridium difficile um, uh, diarrhea that you've got from your antibiotics. Um, and you know, the, the species are incredible. I mean, remember there's two kilograms of bugs in your guts. There's two kilograms of bugs and they're doing stuff and we're only starting to understand the power of the microbiome. So there's lots of places for it to do things. Diabetes, atherosclerosis, metabolic syndrome, obesity, irritable bowel disease, liver cirrhosis. Fantastic area and I think in the next 15 or 20 years there's going to be some phenomenal discoveries about how to tweak the microbiome. What about organs on a chip? This is also a really cool sort of area to think about. Um, remember to get a drug from discovery, for example at the bedside, I should say the bench in the Perkins to the bedside is incredibly expensive, about 13 years, $1.4 billion um, and very, very challenging. And that's one of the reasons the drugs are so expensive. But if you've got bits of humans on a chip, on a lab chip, literally a small kidney, a small heart, a small lung, all micro uh, circulation, you can squirt in your drug, you can work out whether you're going to have toxicity, and you can actually then shorten that, that 13 years and $1.4 billion. It's a, an extraordinarily interesting area. and. Um, uh, uh, emerging at a very rapid rate. What about drug repurposing? This is a trial for colchicine. Now many of you will know what colchicine is. It's a drug that's been used uh, for about 50 years in gout. Turns out, when you think about gout, big fat red toe, lots of inflammation, it turns out that in the coronary arteries, just as there is in your fat and your stomach, um, there's an inflammatory response. And it turns out that colchicine, as an anti-inflammatory, may well reduce uh, second events in coronary heart disease. So there's a large trial happening here uh, in, the, in the Perkins, uh, funded by NHMRC, asking a very simple question. Can low-dose colchicine reduce second events in people with ischemic heart disease? And I, uh, we have a pretty strong feeling that, in fact, this is going to work really well. Uh, it's a wonderful example of drug repurposing. What about biomedical engineering? And what's happening in that space? Well, we have people inside the Institute and all across uh, the world fusing clinical medicine and clinical problems in the clinical paradigm with biomedical engineers. This is a slide from my own uh, laboratory, uh, my own institute, I should say, of biomedical engineers who are asking a very simple question clinically. And the question is, in the context of breast cancer, how do you better identify the surgical margin in, in women with breast cancer because unfortunately one in four women who has a breast cancer removed has that has a redo to go back and remove further tumour tissue. So this is a wonderful instrument that's going to end up being a small thimble on the surgeon's finger which will feel a tensile nature of the, of the, uh, uh, of the wound as it were and also has a very small uh, uh, camera and both will give much better definition and therefore much less likelihood that women will need to go back and have a se second operation. So this wonderful fusion between biomedical engineering and uh, clinical medicine. And what about 3D printing? I love 3D printing, it's just amazing. Here's a wonderful example of a guy with a pretty gross tumour who's had a 3D printed um, reconstruction of his face in real terms. Um, and when you think about it, there are artificial kidneys being generated and all sorts of bits of the body uh, that are being generated with 3D printing. We've only seen uh, the beginning of this. The whole, but there's nothing other than your imagination that restricts 3D printing. It's a fantastic field. And very briefly on clinical trials, and I should be finishing soon, shouldn't I, Cameron? Yep. 
On clinical trials, we have a clinical trials facility in the Perkins. It's a 32-bed facility. And even in the clinical trials arena, things are changing dramatically. Um, and what I wanted to share with you w briefly was uh, a couple of things. One, that um, the standard clinical trial is changing. There's a clinical trial called the adaptive clinical trial such that patients coming into it can move from one treatment paradigm to another. And you'll see down here, standard of care has the same number of patients, but in, a, in an adaptive clinical trial, um, when the therapy works, patients can move from one part of the clinical trial to another. A really uh, complex, uh, Bayesian mathematics are challenging, but it's a new way of doing clinical trials. Um, and here's a very simple example of that. Uh, patients based on uh, biomarkers can be subset uh, characterised to different therapies. And it's really a form of precision medicine, and people talk about precision medicine, but this is a very good example of it. So I hope that precision medicine will, will give us some much better guidelines than just exercise more and eat less. Mind you, those are still pretty good guidelines in real terms across the medical sector. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about that other than to say that Andrew Forrest uh, is a great philanthropist and I'm doing quite a bit of work with him and a number of people around the world to try and do a number of things, one of which is to bring um, any clinical trial to any patient with cancer anywhere in the world without leaving their home. And when you think about that, there's a very big audacious goal that we're in the middle of trying to deliver. Um, two slides quickly to, before I finish just to say is that if you look at treatment for cancer over the last 50 years, we've had chemotherapy for a long while, we've had monoclonal antibodies, targeted proteins, immunotherapy is now a reality. siRNA uh, is a burgeoning um, new area and a little thing called microRNA, which is my favourite, um, is, is also burgeoning. And we've done a lot of work in my lab over the last few years. I'm just going to very rapidly go through a few slides and show you um, what we're doing. So liver cancer is the cancer that's most likely by 2030 to have the worst prognosis. It is going up like this. In China last year there was 400,000 patients dying of liver cancer. This is Australian data and those two lines for men and women are incidence and death rate. So basically you get liver cancer, you're going to die. It's incredibly uh, rotten tumour to get. So we've been working on liver cancer on a receptor called the EGF receptor, epidermal growth factor receptor. It's expressed in lots of liver cancers and it's a wonderful target. And this little tiny non-coding RNA called microRNA7 is a wonderful inhibitor of the EGF receptor. So we're commercialising this um, and taking this towards the clinic. We're replacing microRNA7. It's a tumour suppressor. It's lost in, in uh, liver cancers. And one little bit of data um, from my own lab. These are mouse livers. These are non-treated or controlled treated, and this is with microRNA7. You've got to remember that when you're looking at mice, you have a preclinical arena, and if you can get rid of the tumour in mice, that's, a, that's the forerunner before what you give uh, into uh, non-human primates and then into phase one clinical trials. So we are very actively taking this little drug uh, towards early phase clinical trials, and that's the, uh, the company that we've been working in, uh, the original work done in the Perkins University of Western Australia, and now in this company called Miravan. And again, the prognosis is so poor in liver cancer that if we could make any dent on that uh, disease outcome, it would be an extraordinary uh, change. So, lessons learned. Let me just give you this. Um, I, I truly believe medicine is not your career. You're not identified because you're a medical student or you're a doctor. Uh, it is absolutely not your life. It is just um, your career. And just never get them mixed up. Um, I was, um, this morning I was talking to someone who um, was talking to about a surgeon and the surgeon said he feels like God uh, most of the time because people are bowing in front of him, this particular person and the reality is sometimes um, they get mixed up and their identities get mixed up. The reality is be very careful of that. Maintain a very full and varied life outside of medicine. 
Um, maintain your honesty and integrity at all costs. There's a really big line in medicine, a really, really big line. If you cross across that line, you can never come back. You can never, ever come back once you've crossed the line. And there are a lot of areas of confidentiality, of a patient uh, privilege, of, uh, you know, there are plenty of doctors who cross that line who, who try and come back. You never can. Be generous of spirit. It'll be returned in spades when you're at the least expecting it. That's an incredibly important part of life. Just give. And I've learnt this over and over again. Never, ever judge a book by its cover because you're invariably going to be wrong. Patients come in, they look dreadful, they're, they're incredibly sick. And in fact, I see people who are thorotoxic, they're all narky, they're short-tempered. And, and you know, when they're treated, they're a completely different person. Be curious, ask questions, remember how important research is as a foundation for clinical medicine and love the new technology. Whether you like it or not, it's coming at you as fast as and you can't avoid it. And I think that um, through my life, there have been colleagues in distress. Um, and you think you're doing something, but you don't necessarily do it. And the reality is, you've got to do it. Uh, and um, you know, I've had yeah, some, some friends who have, who have passed because of, because of that. Learn from mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make heaps of mistakes. Hopefully they're not going to be the ones that kill people, but the reality is you're going to make mistakes and that's when you've got to learn. And be, uh, at the end of the day, just make sure you have fun. Remain half glass full. If you're a half glass empty person, it's incredibly difficult to work with you and most people who are half glass empty end up not working with people who are half glass full. And you guys this week, it's impossible to rest your liver, but if you can rest your liver, that's really good because it can't take too many insults. It certainly can't take too many weeks like this. And I think this is really where you're going to be. The era of medicine you're going to be in is one where there's going to be much more cost-conscious medicine. Um, you know, this guy says to the patient, your insurance will cover either the vasectomy or the anaesthetic you will call. And the reality is I've never until recently been in a situation where the hospital has restricted what drugs we can give, and they now do. And I think that's going to be a really massive issue for you guys as you practice medicine. And make sure you use medicine as the most wonderful catalyst to travel. Uh, and every picture you've ever seen of Machu Picchu, when you get there, it's better than every single picture you've ever seen. It's wonderful. And I use medicine to travel, but also just love travelling. So look, with that, I'm a few minutes over time, but thank you very much indeed, and I'm very happy to have answer any questions. Alrighty, so we're just going to um, probably just have time for a couple of questions. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, it was great to hear some of the lessons you've shared and um, all the new exciting developments that are happening in medicine. Um, so a bit of a, a bit of an interesting question. Can you tell us a bit about your band? <laughs> <laughs> what, you know, what's, what's your name? When's the next gig? <laughs> <laughs> next gig, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so the band, uh, so we were med, med students, um, four of us. Um, and that was our job. We used to play twice a week or thereabouts. Um, so rather than working in, in the coffee shop, we'd play twice a week and we'd undercut all the other bands. So there was a cardiologist, there was a neurologist, um, there was a, a urologist and myself. And we've recently gained an anaesthetist and, and a medical technologist. So we were called lots of different names early on. We were called uh, Graham Hankey and the MDs. Graham Hankey's a phenomenal neurologist. Um, and we're now called the specialists <laughs> because we're a bunch of specialists. And it's incredibly difficult. 20 years went past, we're all travelling all around the, whole, around the world, all with kids, it's impossible to find the time. Even now, getting six specialists together who travel a lot is very challenging. And what do we play? We play any, air covers, um, rock and roll, In Excess, um, Joe Cocker, Beatles, Stones. It's a wide, a very wide variety. And the wonderful thing is when we jump on the, our kit and transform my house or our house uh, into a, a sound studio, it's like we were transformed back to when we were 20. It's the same jokes, the same mucking around, the same laughs. It's wonderful. And what I've said, I can only say this, is that you know, medicine's not your life um, and uh, there's so much more involved. And if it, the, the very, very best things that I've done in my life is my family. Absolutely. All the other stuff, all the other hats that you wear, much, much less important than your family. It's awesome. So good to hear. Any questions from the crowd?
great, great question. So, um, got quite a few um, young medical students and doctors I've mentored over the years, uh, and uh, several Rhodes Scholars. Okay, um, and if you think about it, the Rhodes Scholars they do their first year as an intern, they disappear at Oxford, and then they do their PhD. Uh, and then they come back and do um, you know, more clinical work, et cetera. It's incredibly challenging getting funding uh, as an independent investigator in science, okay? And so the, the best time in real terms is to do your clinical work. So you, you qualify, you do your clinical work. You then, if you choose to specialise, specialise, then start your research and continue it with a, um, a postdoc be that in clinical research or applied research or in biodiscovery research, it doesn't really matter what. But if you, in fact, you start research and do a PhD and then you get more clinical work, you lose all that um, that inspiration and vitality and dynamism you have when you're in that in that phase, and you actually want your PhD or masters or clinical research followed up by additional research to make yourself competitive in the funding landscape, whatever that might be, wherever you are. It's the same across the world. It's challenging everywhere. People do get funds, uh, and the Australian government has had the good sense recently to double, and I mean double, the entire investment into health and medical research over the next few years. Um, and that's the Medical Research Future Fund, or MRFF, uh, and it's taking the funding from about a billion to two billion by 2022. A lot of that work is actually, or a lot of those funds are going to be for more translational and, and further down the clinical research spectrum. So I think for those who are doing clinical research, uh, it's going to be a fantastic boom. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Thanks so much for your time, Peter, and for sharing with us today. Yeah, and um, please stick around for our next plenary talk. Thanks, great. everyone. Thank you. <laughs>